Uh, welcome back. And uh, we're very fortunate now to be joined by a fantastic panel of speakers uh, to discuss and explore how we in the cultural and media sectors can better nurture local voices and uh, put authentic sort of local stories on a national stage. Um, I'm going to be joined um, uh, by Diana Hare, who is leader, a leadership coach and commissioner for BBC England. Uh, welcome, Diana. Do you, would you like to do a brief introduction? Yes. So uh, just from a visual point of view to say that I've got long blonde curly hair, a red dress and a blue wall behind me. Um, so uh, did you want a description of my job as well or is that all you need? And with a brief description, that would be lovely. OK, so I've I've wa actually worked in local broadcasting for over 30 years. Uh, I'm currently a commissioner for the BBC, uh, commissioning factual content right across arts, history, science and um, yeah, just just very broad. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And next, I'm going to welcome um, our own Rob Lindsay, who is head of programmes for the space. Hi, Rob. Hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, do you want me to describe myself? Yes, please. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is Rob Lindsay. I'm head of programmes for the space. I'm a middle aged man with dark curly hair and a blue shirt on today. Fantastic. And then Matthew Dodd, who is the Commissioning Editor for Speech and Arts Programmes on Radio 3 and 4. Welcome, Matthew. Hi, everyone. Yeah, hi. I'm, I've got uh, black but greying hair. I've got thick uh, black eyebrows and wearing glasses. Um, I, yes, as, as Fiona said, I commission the um, speech bits of BBC Radio 3 and the arts programmes for BBC Radio 4. Thank you. Now, we are also going to be joined, we hope, by Barbara Lee, who's the Commissioning Editor for Art and Entertainment at Sky. But I think we have a small technical issue at the moment getting Barbara online. So she will join us and I will let her introduce herself then. Um, but really, I want to start by asking all of you a relatively simple question. Why should we be worried about nurturing local voices? Why, why does that matter to you in your various broadcast and, and online commissioning roles? And can Matthew, can I throw that to you first of all? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, well, the reason why I'm preoccupied with it is because um, in my experience, I think that every part of the UK has got great cultural stories to tell. I'm very confident of that. And I feel it incumbent on me to work with people to find those. And if I can't find them, then I feel that, um, you know, I'm, I, that's an area I've got to develop. Um, I think there's a di an additional point for radio which is that radio is not great at the epic, the universal. Um, it's, it, can, it tells its stories best through the local, through the personal, through the intimate. And so if we're trying to, t if we're trying to tell a story, let's say, as, we, as, as I once did about um, uh, in the, when Coventry was um, City of Culture, about modernism and modern architecture and the change that that brought, on Britain in the night after the war in the 1950s, the best way to tell that story is not through a kind of big story about the transformation of Britain, but to tell the story of Coventry and its rebuilding. And, and everyone, no matter where they are, can actually understand that story through the very specifics of Coventry's story. So, and, and that, is, that is the approach I take to, to almost all the commissioning that I do for Radio 3 and Radio 4. And, and therefore, we need partners in local areas to help us do that. Absolutely. And Diana, is it sort of similar for you in terms of television? Yes, absolutely. And just picking up on what Matthew said there. So, so I, I think it's um, it's usually, in fact, let's say always the case that that something very small and local and specific, um, if it has those touch points, um, that that. It enables it to connect with an audience everywhere then then that's the basis of the great story because we we respond emotionally and and so I'm usually looking for stories that are specific and are, and are rooted somewhere because I also think that place is incredibly important to us um, it's a reference for us it um, it's part of what makes us what we are so not only is a sense of place really useful to a story 
it also um, it also helps to connect, I think, and and sometimes we ignore it when when we shouldn't. Um, and um, I, I'm just thinking about uh, the example that that uh, I was involved in also with Coventry City of Culture with the story of Two Tone. It was a fantastic example of something that that had a very um, strong sense of place but resonated with people on so many levels because of, of the of those touch points you know um music um enjoyment growing up fashion i mean i i could go on and on <clears throat> but i think also in terms of why does it matter it's absolutely crucial that we represent uh, and find those stories um across the whole of uh, the UK or England in, in terms of uh, my uh, recent remit, because things look different depending on where you are. So if you're not finding and telling those stories from across the whole of the country, you're really not speaking to the whole um, of, of, of our population, of our audience. Absolutely. And Rob, sort of looking at our kind of commissioning remit within our kind of programmes that are obviously more focused on kind of online publication, online audiences, although we do obviously work with broadcasters as well. But what do you think that what do you think the importance of this is for us? I, I mean, I think it's it's hugely, hugely, hugely important. Um, I think particularly over the past couple of years, um, in terms of the stories that have really chimed with people, they have been about um, authenticity they have been about voice and obviously location is an enormous part of that particularly with young people um, the location in which they live in which they find themselves can have a massive massive impact on a young person it might be that they've grown up in the same area their entire life and the area around them is presented in a particular way and that doesn't chime with their own personal experiences and they want to talk about their version of a particular city or a particular town or a particular village that already has um, a particular reputation. It may be that they've moved house and their pace of life or their uh, social opportunities have, have changed dramatically for better or for worse. It, it can be any number of things. It may be that they are looking to move on or are finding themselves or are leaving something behind or whatever it might happen to be. And place is an enormous part of all of that. It, it has to it has to be acknowledged in any young person's story and I would argue even their own sense of identity as well so I think it's hugely hugely important absolutely and I'm just going to remind everybody uh, our audiences if you've got questions that your or thoughts and comments you'd like to feed into this conversation please do use the hop in chat to to kind of speak to us about that um I guess the other thing that I'm really interested in because we've talked about kind of individuals and the importance of giving those voices access to the platforms and, and places that, that that we all that we all know and work in. But I wonder, um, Rob, I'm going to come back to you with this. How important do you think it is that we're supporting the, there being a kind of an ecology to support that within a local area? How how important are the are the baseline of knowing that you're not the only person who's interested in telling their story or sharing those experiences? Yeah, I think it's absolutely vital. And I think the the balancing act comes in ensuring that people who are outside of those um, more traditional hubs, those larger cities, to make sure that they feel that they have the opportunity to meet and mix with their creative contemporaries, um, for them to collaborate. Um, and crucially for them to be able to do that without fear of competition you know without fearing that there are only so many places on schemes or opportunities that might be available to them and that actually the the you know that whole look to your left look to your right only one of you will be here once we've gone through five different stages of shortlisting and all that sort of thing making sure they genuinely can see the people around them as as collaborators um you know ecosystems can be still incredibly successful even if they are niche even if they are focused in key areas or with relatively small groups as well but it is hugely important that they at least exist as a starting point absolutely and diana can i bring you in on that because obviously the bbc has always had a traditional um belief as part of its public service remit that it, it should provide those, those kind of skills-based opportunities um but but 
a lot of things have changed in the last 10 years and with social media and, and other kind of outlets for people to tell their stories on. How do you think the BBC is, is responding to that? And what do you think the opportunities are for it as a broadcaster to, to kind of help support those grassroots infrastructures? Yeah, gosh, that's a big question. But <laughs> I, I think you mentioned ecology and I think that's that's a really useful word because I think it's absolutely what, what we need. So so things happen when people come together and and great ideas can grow from from tiny little roots. So I think having those uh, opportunities and those spaces um on all levels are, are a really important part of the picture and and just where um, ideas might be grown from. That's not to say at the other end where I sit, you know, that all those ideas are going to find a place on on national telly because clearly they're not. Um, but that might not always be the right place for them. Um, and and so I think it's fantastic. And, and I've seen over my career, you know, that that whole range of opportunities growing for, for where and how uh, people can share and tell their stories. Um, in terms of how the BBC is responding, I think it's it's always an ongoing um, thing. Um, I think it is really important to have commissioners based outside of London. I've always been, I'm personally based in Norfolk. I've never been based in London. Hence my passion for, um, you know, uh, making sure that we keep those perspectives, if you like. So I think that's really important. There's now a, a range of um, assistant commissioners who are also based outside. We've got our kind of... Um, our eco structure, if you like, with with um, the local bases across the country. So I think all of those things are important. But as I say, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that all those ideas that might be coming from all over the place are are going to end up as pieces of broadcast TV. So it's our role, therefore, to find those stories that really we think can speak to a larger audience. And I'm talking about the, the TV level here. Absolutely. And and Matthew, obviously, radio is a great um, entry level or audio is a great entry level place for people to to kind of hone some of their skills. And we've seen a huge proliferation in podcasts and and lots of other audio streamers. What what do you think is perhaps is is there something missing in that ecology in terms of how we make sure that those local voices have the skills and the profile to be able to kind of as Diana says, we all know there's a there's a process here, you know, there's a need for profile and familiarity to be there. For, for people to kind of reach uh, national broadcast level, either radio or television. But what do you think the grassroots might need to sort of help embed these local stories? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I think, I mean, firstly, obviously, as Diana said, that's absolutely right. One of the things that's changed in the time that I've worked is, 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 in this world is that there's just a huge proliferation of actually different ways in which people can show what they can do, whether podcasting, whether talent schemes. Um, and, and there's, we, you know, there's been, a, it's forced up in a, in a very positive way is made us to realize the huge variety and the opening up of different ways in towards, um, uh, towards using audio. I think, uh, again, as Diane said, the, the, the big issue is that the leap between the, um, having done a small project and getting onto, let's say, national radio is still a, a big step because of the limitation of whether it's, you know, podcasts um, that, are, that are invested in or broadcasting. And for me, for, for, for national radio, one of the things that we're trying to do is develop more local independent production companies who we work with on a regular basis so that we have a kind of, in a way, we have trusted partners in lots of parts of the UK who know what we're looking for, who we trust, um, and so that they can develop and work with local talent and then, you know, and, and, and keep us abreast of what they're doing so that they who are um, successful at um, producing programmes for national radio can actually say to us, well, actually, we, you know, we're working with this person, we're developing this person, we recommend them. And, and you know, we, we, to some extent, will rely on their, on their recommendations. And it's almost as if, um, you know, um, we're, 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 we're doing a, we're in a partnership with them. Um, and because we, 
you know, we're looking at the whole country. And so we need people who we know where we work with and we will try and go with their recommendations of, 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 of what, what, what they say. And that, you know, in the West Midlands, there's a few um, independent production companies who I work with very, very closely. And I, you know, I totally believe what they tell me. And, the, and we've, there's lots of new voices that they brought on, as you say, entry level, um, because I know that they will also work with them um uh in the way that we would like and and that's um you know that that's been very effective so far but it's still it is it is you know there's no there's no doubt that you know um it, it's not as if we suddenly have endless amount of hours for people and there is a step up absolutely and barbara has now joined us so welcome barbara barbara um is the uh commissioner for um arts and entertainment at sky uh barbara welcome i don't know if you'd like to just do a short introduction <laughs> yes apologies for my late arrival good afternoon everyone i had major technical problems when i'm in now but i was listening so i i, I think i'm up to speed so I'm Barbara Lee. I work as commissioning editor for Sky Arts and Entertainment. Um, I'm supposed to describe myself. So I have shoulder length fair hair and I'm wearing a blue top with some kind of strange designs on me. Hope that helps. <laughs> welcome, welcome. So we, we're talking about kind of the importance of local voices, of encouraging and nurturing new talent to come through um, from across across the, the UK nations. Um, and I just wondered sort of, from a sky perspective, particularly a sky arts perspective, because we are talking about the cultural sector here, um, what do you think the importance of those voices, that range of voices, is to Sky as a broadcaster? I think it's hugely important, Fiona. I mean, particularly on Sky Arts. Um, so for us, we've sort of made a very definite decision to um, work. Uh, with as many regional and national indies as possible. Obviously, we're broadcast, we're not, we're not a digital platform. So we try and support even digital content on the platform where we can. I think I, think I heard everybody reference this. I think we all know it's hugely important. And then the, the, you know, the UK is diverse. It's not just about London, as I think it was Matthew said about the various hubs. I think it's important for people to feel that they have a voice and um, that they get to tell their story. Storytelling is really important. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, we try and support that a lot through partnerships. So we do a lot. We've done things with you, Fiona. We're doing something new, which is just really exciting and brilliant. Um, I think we, you know, we've done things even through our programs. And Maddie referenced a few things earlier, like the park bench plays, and we've done Unlocked. We were a partner with Coventry City of Culture. Um, uh, we've done things with Galwad, um, you know, in Wales. So I know this is specifically about the West Midlands, but, you know, we try and do as much as we can where we can. Obviously, as I said, our broadcast requirements would have come first, but we do a lot off screen and through our partnerships, um, we try and represent the country, UK and Ireland. We have in our remit as a whole. But I think, I mean, I don't think any of us can deny the importance of, of regional storytelling and representation. It's hugely important. I say, as I'm Irish as well. <laughs> I should have said that. I think you all got that. I have an Irish accent. That's a distinguishing feature. <laughs> it, it's interesting because we work together um, with Coventry City Culture and with um, Shoot Festival and Sky on the Unlocked series mm. of short films um, during the City of, of Culture. And what was really interesting to me, because that was, that was a completely open program for uh, creative artists to apply. And there's a tendency quite often for those short film pro short film programs to be about kind of emerging talent what was really interesting was it, it actually was a really broad range of people ages ethnicities you know, I mean it, it had mm. and, and actually the point that united the 10 films was just that they were stories that were not being told you know and and I just sort of wondered I know that you know that 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 you guys have been very pleased with that series but is that what you expected us to get out of that when we began that process absolutely I mean I think the wonderful thing about those kind of schemes is you're right you can't predict what's going to come through and that's what's brilliant you know when you're commissioning a program specifically you know, I commission quite big series from portrait artists, landscape artists, you know, landmark, master crafters. And within, within those, we cover regional um, talent and activity. But of course, that's very specific to those programs. Whereas I think through those other schemes, you get people to tell because there's sort of no parameters apart from great storytelling. 
So I think that's what's always wonderful and surprising. Um, and that's the beauty of those things, you know. Um, so, yeah. Absolutely. And I guess what what's interesting about the way that we were able to work with with you and with Shoot Festival, a team based in, you know, right in the heart of that cultural ecology in Coventry, we knew what level of support and mentoring individual artists needed, you know, and and we were able to kind of tailor that. And I do think, Rob, that is one of the issues, isn't it, really, that that you need to have the bandwidth uh you know it's going to come down to resource and by resource i probably mean money um you know to actually support the different needs of different uh, different artists in different contexts yeah yeah a hundred percent a hundred percent i think there's um i think as we particularly as if you're working with people that maybe this is a uh an early opportunity for them again um this is maybe their first time working on something Again, it may be that you you do need to make sure that that person is supported in the right way, and it might be that the means of support that they require aren't the same every single time as well. I think it does um, sometimes mean that you do have to offer, um, I don't want to say a bespoke level of support in place. This is some fantastically expensive fitted suit or something like that, but it is just being prepared to, to talk to the person and, and find out what it is that they need in a particular area because again we've talked again about ecology we've talked about community we've talked about ownership of stories you know it's all the kind of same themes come in but the implications of that can be very very different from one place to the next yeah. absolutely and diana i think it, you would recognize this but we were very um aware in taking 10 filmmakers or 10 creative artists not in fact they weren't all filmmakers they were writers choreographers um people from very different backgrounds that that there was that um there was that it, you know, this is for broadcast so now there are a whole load of other considerations that have not come into your into your kind of remit of creativity previously about what you can put on a screen what time of night you can put that on a screen what you have to say how you have to have that kind of editorial impartiality you know how you have to declare those those things and Diana that's you know you're very much kind of embedded in in that kind of process of telling those finding those local stories getting them out there um and i just sort of wondered what what would you say are the qualities of a local commission that really helps it to cut through and what and what support do you find that you need to offer so let me take the support question first because um just to echo what what's already been said there that that yes bandwidth is needed um, I'm thinking about um, some local projects that we supported in the West Midlands with new production companies or, or very, very fresh production companies, also working with with very new talent. And um, it's time consuming, but but it's worth the investment because of the richness that, that can come out of, of, you know, just the greater range of voices. So so having the time and preparing the time to invest is is really critical. Um, being individual about it too, in terms of the support and nurturing that is needed. Um, uh, I'm thinking about a, 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 a young man up in the Northeast called Kemma Kay, who we recently made a film with uh, about therapy. And um, I think Kemma is a fantastic talent. Um, the uh, production company that worked with him the name of which has totally left me, but it may come back. Um, apologies, Andrew, if you're listening. Um, it was was the support that that company gave him was was second to none. It was absolutely superb, and it didn't end at product at broadcast. It carried on after that. Um, so yes, investment, tailored support, um, and in terms of um, what can then come out of it. Again, I'm thinking. Um, of two tone the Coventry story again mm -hmm. I think the reason for this is no one's actually mentioned partnership so uh, perhaps mm. let me just say something about that because mm. that project wouldn't have happened without the partnership uh, between ourselves uh, Coventry City of Culture um, and um, full fat the production company so so I think again good things happen when people come together um, mm. both in terms of, of the actual working but in terms of the moment as yeah. well so 
as I think I've already said, you know, the, the success of that story was um, the partnership having common aims and being able to nurture and, um, and work through that um, in the frame of those common aims, but also with a story that just had so much resonance for people. So local mm. story, big impact. Fantastic. And Matthew, what in terms of radio, because obviously, again, we are talking about artists coming through from the cultural sector and having this increased profile by presenting work digitally. Um, radio is a very specific form. What are you looking for in, in, in if you meet a sort of a, a theatre writer or somebody who's kind of coming from the cultural sector? What are you looking for in their skill sets or their storytelling that you think will translate well to radio? Wow, that's a big question. I mean, that's what I spend most of my time doing, I think. Um, I mean, the, fir the, the first thing I would say is actually just picking up on what Diana said, that just the way we look at this is that, I mean, I, I would say that, you know, when um, for our audiences, the way that they're listening to this is through their interest in new talent not necessarily through local talent, it's through new talent. I think the audience has got an interest and a keenness to hear about, you know, people who are new to that field, whether they be writers, musicians, you know, contributors, whatever. That's what brings them. Our, our job is to make that from diff the different regions of the UK, different nations of the UK. But for the audience, it's about the newness. And I think that the audiences, especially on something like Radio 3, where we have kind of later slots with smaller audiences, they have a, they, as someone said, a bandwidth, they have a tolerance for the new and the different, for something which needs a bit more lean in, because they expect us to deliver that for them. That's one of our duties as a public service broadcaster. And so that's what I'm thinking about when I... Look, meet new people is what can they add what is the audience going to think wow this is original this is fresh um and the way i would you know the one thing i would say is that we would understand immediately that this is going to need more time and is going to need partners who um know how to work with new talent we want to make it as easy as possible for for for, for that process to work together so I, I wouldn't say there's anything specific that I'm looking for that, you know, um, this is that this they have to be like this way or they have to be like this. What we're interested in is that they've got something to say and we've got a process in place to help m work out with them whether it's going to be right for, for, for what audience expectations are around kind of new voices in, in whatever, whatever form they be. And I think that's the, I mean, you know, in, in, Within that, that's where all the work's going on. That's the challenge for both them and for us to kind of come together and make that work. Yeah. Fantastic. Ba Barbara, I just kind of wondered, I wanted to bring you back in there because um, what sort of impact do you think? You said about obviously Sky is there as a broadcaster, but but you are interested in in kind of, you know, what you're putting out there in, a, in an online context. Obviously, Sky Arts came out from behind the paywall and mm -hmm. which allows for you to kind of push artists forward. You know, perhaps I just wondered what difference you felt that had made to to the to the artists that you think you can feature on Sky Arts if it did and sort of and and also sort of what the impact of the proliferation of new channels that people can be presenting themselves on has been on the cultural community? Yeah, so I think um, for us, I mean, we went free to air in the middle of COVID, actually. Being one of our, you know, we have, like any, any company or broadcast or whatever, we have our pillars um, that we try to commission into. And we have sort of three key things that get commissioned, which is participation, because for us, it's really important um, you know, one of our things, we all have our little things that we say, don't we, you know, is access all arts, art available for everybody. So the first way to do that is to take the channel from behind the paywall, which is great, so everyone can get it for free. But the other thing that's sort of, we don't do it with every commission, it's just not possible, but we try and do it where possible, where we take, we try not to let everything just exist on the telly box in the corner. So we're trying to get people involved in art, which is where the participation thing comes in. And a good example I can give of that actually was a, land, a project called Landmark, where we ended up partnering actually with Coventry City of Culture. And the idea for that really was to, we split the UK, Ireland up into six regions and nations. And we had three artists, established artists within their region or nation 
who participated to create public art. And so the idea was that over the course of the programs, three pieces of public art were left in that region or nation for people to come and enjoy, which was great. And the final piece was um, a mesh sculpture of Ira Eldridge, which was is left now in the, I think it's the new art center, which was the old Ikea building. It's a great repurpose, I think. <laughs> <laughs> the best repurpose ever. Um, in Coventry for people to go to and enjoy. The other thing I think, so that's kind of how from, because there is so much kind of competition and space out there, isn't there? And everybody, you know, we never, I will honestly say, we rarely get pitched a bad idea. It's just how do we split up our content, you know, across all the various art forms, you know, that's the other thing. Um, so one other thing that we do, which I think is really important, I think Matthew and both Rob alluded to it, and Diana possibly, which is about how do you nurture up and coming talent? So we created two years ago an ambassador scheme. So basically we work with Charles Hazelwood, you know, runs the power orchestra. He's an ambassador, Bernadina Veristo, Anish Kapoor, Akram Khan and Nadia Fall. And it was really important for us that in their ambassadorial role that actually they're nurturing talent. So each of them are selecting four, five, six, depending on the discipline of people who can come up and that's a great way, I think, going back to the mentoring thing that Diana mentioned, it's important that you don't, you know, you give people the opportunity and then it's adios, you know. So for us, it's how do you kind of continue to support um, talent? And that's very important. So that may not end up as an on-screen thing, but it's very important that we're using our on-screen talent to help nurture talent. It's kind of passing the baton, isn't it, really? Um Oops. And then I think the other thing, Sky Studios, which I don't work for, I think they're in partnership with Birmingham Rep. Again, this is for comedy talent, comedy writing talent. So they run a scheme where, again, there's uh, mentoring and nurturing. Um, and I think that's really important because that will be, they'll be the next big stars. These will be the people, I think, who, you know, we cannot, we'll all be watching and enjoying their work in time to come. So I think for us, that's always a really important thing is how do we help nurture the next generation and also how do we give some kind of platform to established artists who are out there in the regions and nations and landmark was a was a good example of that i think you know um, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. and but, but perfect segue actually because we've got some questions <laughs> coming in from the audience uh so uh, which absolutely picks up on on that point barbara so and um, the question was would the panel talk a bit more about what next after the first, after the emerging project schemes, after the random acts, the new creatives, the kind of, you know, what what are, what do you think or what are you all doing to kind of go, okay, but what about that next stepping stone? How do you then help that artist or that voice to consolidate? And um, Diana, can I come back to you with that? Yes, and again, um, with the with the rider, of course, one can't necessarily promise that there'll be a follow up commission after something. Yeah. But but what I have seen happen is that as part of that sort of first break process, other relationships will have grown out of that. Um, so perhaps between on screen talent and a production company, um, and and also visibility. You know, so um, to have had your first uh, piece of work uh, on a broadcast platform or a digital platform or whatever it might be means that your visibility has already had a bit of a head start. Um, but then um, I think, again, you know, relationships are really important. And whether or not that's with us as commissioners or with other people involved in those projects, there's a certain amount that, that we can and should and do do in terms of continuing to support that through through an ongoing dialogue. Um, but actually, it isn't about the responsibility being completely on us. It's also about that, that those people, that those creatives who have had that first break to then use that opportunity for themselves. So there's that sort of nurturing, but not dependency, shall we say. Um, but again, it brings me back to that point of ecology. You know, we're, we're all part of this, aren't we? And um, again, you know, um, making sure that those networks are there um, is is really important. 
And, and Rob, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Because New Creatives, which which the space was not involved with initially, that was commissioned out through regional hubs around England, funding from BBC and Arts Council England. But but you were involved, and we came in to actually give that support to the to the commissioned artists to look at their own distribution potential profile raising. Do you want to just talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Color? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I I made a note to talk about exactly that actually, and it and it is a program that um, I've got a lot of praise for because I think there was exactly that recognition um, that exactly as has been said. It, it, often it isn't the case that a second commission can be guaranteed or that follow up work can be guaranteed, and so those programs that do have and again, you know. Um, what Barbara was talking about as well, that element of mentoring as well. It isn't just about creating that first piece. It isn't about just creating that kind of, that breakout uh, piece of media, that breakout story. It may well be about saying, well, look, how do you now take this and leverage this moving forward? How do you as well get as much out of that first process to learn as much as possible with all of this additional resource and bandwidth so that if you're then going to, pick up a commission from someone else that maybe it might not be part of a program like that, might not be part of a scheme like that, um, that you know robustly how to um, work with a commissioner, how to, when to take notes and when to dig your heels in and things like that. Mm. And then at the same time, how to make sure that the piece that you've made is going to work as hard as possible for you. So exactly as, as Fiona's just said, we did work on that program to look at um helping each of those emerging creatives establish how that piece could react as a calling card, how it could go out into the world, how it could uh, attract the attention of, of future collaborators, future commissioners, whoever it might happen to be. And I think skills like that are incredibly, incredibly important. Um, we did a lot of work with people just establishing that if someone hears, for example, here's your work on the radio and here's your name at the end of the piece, uh, are they going to be able to find you? Are they going to be able to reach out to you in a way that you're comfortable with, in a way that uh, works for you, in a way that can lead on to future things? And that kind of element is still incredibly important. So all kudos yeah. and credit to any programme that includes that as an element. I think it should not be overlooked. Thank you. Another great question, and unfortunately it's going to be the last one we can take, but I want to come round to all of you to ask your reactions to this one. So um, have you experienced any challenge in addressing the idea of authenticity in stories rooted in local places, given that they're ever evolving and associated with different lived experiences? How do you navigate those challenges? Matthew, would you like to go first? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think for me, well, the, the, the first thing is that I don't have a fixed idea of what authenticity in a local place is, and I wouldn't assume that. I would want to hear from the people who are bringing the stories what they think is authentic about what they're proposing. And, um, you know, yeah, and, and, and I wouldn't, um, and that might be, um, you know, not having presuppositions about what their story should be because of the area that they come from. And they might have other perspectives and different perspectives. And, and I mean, absolutely. I think, you know, um, I, uh, I think authenticity is something that we're always looking for. It's something that the audience is really interested in and very sensitive about. Um, uh, but, um, but I don't think we would, I don't, I suppose the one way is that we wouldn't seek to impose it. And we would want to, we would want all the ideas to be, you know, um, led from the bottom up. And, and I, I think that's that's as much as I can say, really, and absolutely associated with lived experience. I mean, that's what in radio, which, you know, a spoken medium, that's what we're really talking about very often is people's lived experience. Absolutely. Barbara, what, what, what do you, what's your thoughts on this? One? Well, I completely agree with Matthew. I mean, that's that's the point, isn't it? Really? You know, if you want people to tell their stories, then they've got to be authentic and credible. And I think particularly on television, we can all spot in authenticity a mile off, you know, and you can't presume other people's lived experience. I think for us as a channel, when we get involved in partnerships or in any work, we collectively as a team, we don't, we don't, um, we don't meddle. We don't meddle in projects. You give them, as Rob alluded to earlier, you kind of go, you know, the rules are keep it legal, <laughs> make sure it's compliant. <laughs> we always say that, keep it legal, make sure it's compliant. <laughs> and beyond that, really, 
you know, the usual TV rules. But actually, there's no point in doing any of this unless the stories are authentic, incredible. So no matter what project we're doing, we listen to an artist. Most of them are artist driven, you know, and that is across the whole range of art, you know. Um, so I think that's really, really important. You know, there's no point in commissioning projects um, and then meddling in them and telling people what to say. That's the idea. You give people creative freedom to express themselves. I think that's the most important thing, um, certainly from our point of view. So we just stand back and let people get on with it. It's a, joy to hear, it's a joy to hear you say it. It's not my lived experience of every commissioning editor. No, in nor was it mine, Fiona, as a producer. <laughs> nor was it mine as a producer. And that's, I think, Sky Arts is, is quite unique in that. You know, I mean, on other channels and other shows, you know, there's maybe, a, a, you know, because every channel has a strategy. But for arts, I think it's very specific. Um, yeah. And that for us is really, really, really important. And actually, you know, that's how we learn about each other and how we find out about each other's stories. And I think, you know, when we're doing a project like Galwad in, in Wales and Festiniog, you know, quite a mad big project. We didn't get involved at all editorially in that because that's their project. So there's no point in us showing it if it becomes produced and actually, yeah. the one thing we're trying to do, and we talk to producers about this all the time, is don't produce it so much. You know, you actually almost have producers need to retrain their own brain because they mm -hmm. tend to want to come in and go, it needs to be like this. And that for us is really important. We're going, take the production out. Take, the, take all the rules out where you can. Let's lose those, you know, Brilliant. because you've got to, yeah. You know, you want to have something that's really special and different. Yeah. Diana, I'm going to give you the last word on this one and then we're going to have to close. But but what, what's your feeling on this one? Gosh, OK. So so this this is. Uh, yeah. Um, I, my response to that is carefully and thoroughly. Yes. Although being in a position of commissioning, I, 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 th I suppose the BBC has a particular responsibility to try and reflect um, as authentically as possible. But. For example, the, the the film that we uh, commissioned about the hacienda uh, was was incredibly challenging in lots of ways because you're not only looking at a moment in in cultural history, you've got a, a myriad of different perspectives on what that story meant and how do you navigate that and make sure that um, it's it's as reflective as possible and that comes. Uh, with that, the production company making considerable effort to finding that range of voices and thinking really carefully about about the perspectives that that are then um, included in that film. So carefully and thoroughly, um, and with great thought, uh, would would be my answer to that. Brilliant. Uh, well, listen, thank you all. I know we could probably talk on for mm. a lot longer, but we have to move on now. But thank you, thank you very much to Matthew, to Rob, to Diana, and to Barbara. A pleasure. And thank you all. Um, great. So, well, we are now kind of heading towards the end of this first day, but we do have one more kind of keynote, and I am delighted to be able to now introduce Stuart Thomas. Stuart is the head of Midlands for BBC Local. He is responsible for production of all BBC Local news, audio, and digital content across the region, and is the site lead for the BBC at the Mailbox in Birmingham. He joined the BBC in 2000 from ITV, where he was responsible for their flagship regional news programme, London Tonight. Um, and prior to that, he was at Channel 4 running the news operation on the Channel 4 breakfast programme, Rise. And before that, he spent several years in radio. So Stuart is going to talk to us about the BBC's plans in the West Midlands. Lots of very exciting things to come. Um, but welcome, Stuart. Thank you, Fiona. Um, and for those who can't see me, um, I'm wearing a blue jacket, I'm wearing glasses, and I'm currently sitting uh, in my office uh, at the BBC in Nottingham today. Fantastic. Stuart, I'm going to hand over to you and I will disappear into the green room. Thank you. Look, these are exciting times for the creative industries in Birmingham and for the wider West Midlands region. Um, before I get to them, I want to talk to you a bit about what I consider the heartbeat of the BBC, and that's our local services. So um, uh, in my day job, I run uh, our BBC local services across the Midlands, um, and we are undergoing a, a large scale transformation right now. Our plans to modernise the BBC's local services have got just one aim, to offer more value to communities across England as audiences increasingly turn to digital. 
We want to strengthen our local online news service with more journalists, deliver hard-hitting journalism and invest in new audio output for BBC Sounds. It's all about striking a balance between our existing and much-loved local broadcast services and investing in an exciting portfolio of local online services that we believe will offer greater value to license fee payers. This is a transformation program, not a savings program. That means we're not cutting our spend. Instead, we plan to move about 10% of our funding towards strengthening our local online services and the impact of our storytelling. If our local services are to remain relevant in an increasingly online and on-demand world, we must change. We believe our plans will transform BBC Local into a truly digital-first multimedia operation that will harness all of our amazing content, reaching at least half the population of England every week. We're reprioritising resource from broadcast services into multimedia content and production and strengthening our online services across 43 areas, including four new services. Uh, one of those is in Wolverhampton. We also are creating 11 multimedia investigative teams, developing a podcast commissioning fund and dedicating roles to deliver for BBC Sounds in all of our bases. To do this, we are making changes in local radio and regional news to ensure high quality, distinctive BBC local journalism is available every day when and where audience want it. A truly digital first BBC. So, um, Let's talk about the BBC in the Midlands. What you might know us for best is BBC Midlands Today. It reaches over 2 million people every week. That's 41% of the population. And currently, Midlands Today is the biggest regional news programme in the country. And by the way, the 6.30 News on BBC One is the most watched news programme in Britain. So it beats all of the national news programmes. The 6.30 Regional News on BBC One is the biggest programme uh, biggest news programme in Britain and of, often across many places the most watched programme on any night on, on television. You might have noticed we've had a bit of a makeover too as well. Um, we've had a new set um, like the national news set with a giant video wall all around it and a tower screen and we're now available on BBC One HD. As well as regional television uh, we've also got our online services and we've got our linear radio services so that's BBC Radio WM, CWR, Radio Stoke, uh, Radio Hereford and Worcester, uh, and Radio Shropshire. Right, so how we serve our audiences in every community of the UK is really important, and I hope our plans for BBC Local demonstrate that. But it also brings me on to our priority for the whole of the BBC uh, and what we call our Across the UK strategy. It's the BBC's biggest transformation in decades, moving power and decision-making across the UK. By 2728, the BBC will be spending, at the very least, an extra 700 million across the UK, generating an additional economic benefit of over 850 million. That dramatically increases opportunities for jobs and training and improving representation on and off screen. The BBC's Across the UK strategy is doing much more to put Birmingham and the wider West Midlands on the map. We know that this is something that when we put our investment and weight behind, it works. BBC contributes significant investment in the creative economy in and around Birmingham. A couple of great examples, the success of Peaky Blinders. It contributed to 42.8 million tourists visiting Birmingham in 2019. And Father Brown enjoys international success in Norway and the US, reaching over 100 million homes. Now, a PwC report published just last November showed how the BBC boosts the growth of creative industries across the UK. A 15% increase in the BBC's local footprint doubles the rate of growth of the surrounding creative industries over time, not just within the media sector, but the whole creative economy. For every £1 of the BBC's economic activity, we generate a total of £2.63 in the economy. And for every one job directly created by the BBC, a further 1.7 jobs are created in the wider economy. As part of Across the UK in the Midlands, we've signed a memorandum of understanding with the West Midlands Combined Authority and the industry body Create Central to work together to turbocharge the creative content sectors in the West Midlands. Birmingham, Europe's, of course, youngest, most diverse city, will be the future of the BBC, the place where the talent of tomorrow is discovered and developed and the hub for our youth-focused brands. The strategy was launched in 2021 and two years into the six-year plan, here's how we're getting on. We said we'd transform the way we commission TV programmes with a clear majority of our UK-wide TV made across the UK, not in London, at least 60% of network TV commissions by spend. 
Well, last year we had My Name is Leon on BC2, an iPlayer. It's set in 1980s Birmingham. It's the uplifting story of nine-year-old Leon, a mixed-race boy, and his quest to reunite his family after being taken into care and separated from his blonde and blue-eyed brother. Starring and executive produced by Lenny Henry and made by his production company, Douglas Road. Uh, next, I want to talk about Phoenix Rise. That's on BBC Three and iPlayer. It's a children's drama set in a West Midlands school, following a diverse group of teens who are taking their first tentative steps back into mainstream education after being excluded. It's filmed in Coventry. It oozes Coventry. The whole thing, the music's from Coventry. Loads of the extras are kids from schools in Coventry. And hopefully, uh, I'll be able to play you uh, a clip of that now. Welcome to Phoenix Rise. You all deserve a clean slate. This is where that starts. Even if the are unteachable. I've been thrown out of every school in the Midlands. One more bad move than I am. So ready for the dance, good vibes, no stress like. Do you want to do something? Like a, a date. The tunes like... Don't worry about your past. At Phoenix Rise, we focus on the future. We're in this together. If one of us goes down, we all go down. There we go, Phoenix Rise, um, uh, already commissioned for a third and fourth series, I should say, in Coventry. Uh, currently in production, This Town, created by Stephen Knight. This tells the story of an extended family and four young people who are drawn into the world of ska and two-tone music, which grew from the grassroots of Coventry and Birmingham in the 70s and 80s, I'm sure you know. Uh, also coming, of course, MasterChef. That's moving one of our biggest programme brands into the West Midlands, demonstrating our commitment to creating jobs and investment. Um, all four strands are coming, MasterChef, Celebrity MasterChef, Junior MasterChef and MasterChef and Professionals. They'll all be filmed at Digbeth's Banana Warehouse, which is part of the new Digbeth Lock Studios and works about to start on the Banana Warehouse any day now. And Silent Witness is coming as well. Uh, it's one of the UK's biggest returning dramas. Uh, it's going to move to the West Midlands from the start of next year. It's a huge quality production for the region. We said we'd transform the commissioning and production of network radio and online audio so that 50% of network radio and music spend will be outside of London by 27, 28. So Radio One Extra presenter Kaylee Golding is currently presenting the station's first ever weekday show to come from Birmingham. That's every Monday to Friday from one till four. Theo Johnson already presents on One Extra from the city on Sunday nights. And just last week, we announced that the 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. program on One Extra will also come from Birmingham. That's from January uh, next year. We said we'd move significant parts of BBC News to centres across the UK, ensuring we cover the stories that matter most to audiences, representing different voices and perspectives. We've moved both Newsbeat, the flagship news programme on BBC Radio 1, as well as all of the uh, news bulletins that go out on Radio 1 and One Extra, and also Asian Network News to Birmingham. And in November last year, they started broadcasting from their new home in the mailbox. We said we'd double our commitment to apprentices and pilot an apprenticeship training agency in the West Midlands. The BBC Apprentice Hub is that agency. It launched in February last year. And it works in partnership with regional businesses. It offers apprenticeships to address skills gaps. It develops talent from diverse backgrounds. And it's effectively a talent agency hiring apprentices for businesses to address skills gaps. Now, the pilot scheme is running in the West Midlands Combined Authority. There's a bright, young and diverse pool of talent, around 2 million working age people. 32% of people are under uh, aged under 25. And of course, it's the most ethnically diverse outside of London. The idea is to create a thriving, flexible talent pool in the creative, digital and cultural sector in the West Midlands that benefits everyone. So how does it work? Well, we've got learning providers who deliver all the learning, paid for by the Levy Fund, which is uh, for our first year being covered by Google. The BBC manages the scheme. It hires the apprentices. It manages all the learning and pays all the other costs. And the businesses offer the placements and pay the apprentices' salary. We've now got 30 apprentices. They've been on placement across seven different standards and working in 21 different businesses in the region. And we've been able to offer some amazing opportunities. And right now, hopefully, we'll better hear from some of the apprentices and their employers speaking about their first-hand experience of the Apprentice Hub.
A personal highlight for me since joining the scheme is having the pleasure to meet Stephen Knight himself and was invited by him to attend the world premiere of his performance of Peaky Blinders with Rambo Dance School. I'm actually based in the video department at Caters and I get to work on all their Snapchat brands which is really interesting because they're all really different and very varied. What I enjoy the most about my job is being able to undergo projects which allow me to express my creativity and explore the world of digital marketing. We're a video production company. We specialise in creating video content for the arts, typically live arts, lots of theatre, dance, music, opera. We're really lucky to have Ben with us. Ben is a junior content producer. He's on a 15-month scheme and he's with us for six. Supporting local talent is so important to us. I I'm from Coventry originally. I grew up like two blocks away from where our office is. And if you had told me when I was a teenager that we could be making films two blocks down the road, I just wouldn't have believed you. I just would have laughed. There just weren't enough opportunities around. And it's really important that we address that because there is so much talent and if you don't nurture it and if you don't help those people they're either going to leave the industry or they're going to leave the area because they, there just won't be the opportunities for them so it's really important that we develop the local talent. I've been looking for an opportunity like this for a long time and all roads led to London and Manchester so the fact that I'm learning about editorial considerations and what that means in production, what it means in casting, getting my name put on the credits, you know, choosing contributors who are actually going to be on the show, listening to their stories, you know, finding out what it means to be a researcher and having that bleed into my, you know, into my life outside of work, um, where I'm looking at people and I'm like, you could be a good person on the show. It's just, it's a surreal experience and I feel like I'm building some sturdy blocks for my future. I'm looking forward to getting stuck into game development in a few weeks time. As a teacher prior to this, I knew I wanted a new challenge and this seemed perfect so I applied for it and I got it. I'm so glad I did as working in the game industry just seemed like an impossible dream. We make journalistic content and getting Laura in this apprenticeship scheme, spot on for us. It wouldn't have happened, but for the hub, the people at the heart who are making this, facilitating all of this, they've done a great job because they go finding the people and they help us to actually tailor and make sure we're getting the right person perfect for the job. It's been really beneficial to us. It, it feels satisfying to have somebody with you who's developing skills and you, you feel that kind of pride in taking that person with you and also it benefits the business. Yeah, it's really win-win, you know, it's, it's a no-brainer. It, it helps the business, it helps the apprentice, it helps the local area, it grows the talent and enriches the skills that we have on our doorstep and it's only a good thing. There we go. And if you'd like to know more, you can check out the website at bbc.co.uk forward slash apprentice hub or one word. Uh, finally, uh, from me, what better way to show our commitment to the regeneration of Digbeth specifically and the Midlands as a whole than by moving there ourselves? So staff in the mailbox will move to the tea factory in 2026. It's the former home of Typhoon Tea. It's just around the corner from Digbeth Lock. Uh, it will become the new home of Midlands Today, BBC Three, our online teams, Radio WM, Newsbeat, Asian Network, One Extra and The Archers. As the anchor tenant of the tea factory, the BBC will be a catalyst for the wider regeneration of the Digbeth Creative Quarter and beyond, helping to attract additional investment and production to the Midlands. But the BBC Director General made it clear that the Across the UK strategy isn't just about the BBC, it's about the wider creative industries as a whole across the region and us working together to turbocharge those creative industries and offer new opportunities. It's really important that we have the talent and skills within the region so we have a creative workforce to draw upon and a talent pipeline to work across the opportunities which are going to be created. That's it. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Stuart. That was brilliant. And uh, I know that we are exactly at time, but I'm just going to very quickly say thank you to Stuart and also to all our other guests today and to the Arts Council England for supporting Digital Culture Talks and to Wolverhampton University for hosting us. Um, there is an evaluation form. There's a link in the chat on Hopin. If you could please, it's very short. We try and not make these things excessive, but it is really important for us to get feedback from you. Um, and apart from that, to say thank you all for joining us. We'll be back online tomorrow with a discussion on digital skills and training provision across the UK and the region. And we hope to see you all then. So thanks again and see you tomorrow. Mm -hmm.